Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 307, featuring a retrospective of one of my favorite uh, strategy games, Empire, War Game of the Century. Uh, now what got me thinking about this, I'm going to have uh, Anthony and Nicola Caulfield on next week to talk about their uh, From Bedrooms to Billions documentary and their upcoming one about the Amiga. So we were uh, really reveling in the Amiga nostalgia, and this is uh, a game I have very fond memories of on my... Uh, playing on my Amiga 1000, so I thought, what the heck. Uh, plus, as it turns out, it has a very interesting and very long history that we'll get into in the video. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Empire War Game of the Century. And here we go. This is a game I played... Oh, I don't know, it feels like hundreds of hours. I used to stay up all night on the weekends playing this with my dad. Good old Interstell Corporation out of Webster, Texas. Well, oh, P.O. Box. <laughs> you know these guys are big time. Well, look at that, look at that comet now. Whew. Intense. Yeah, that's a piece of music I'm pretty sure was not composed for this title sequence, but still sounds good, appropriate. I think that's uh, what in the Hall of the Mountain King or the Dwarf King, something like that. You notice they got lasers and stuff coming out of these guns. That's kind of a weird... I don't know what's going on with that. They cooked up a story I'll share with you a bit later uh, to try to explain what's going on in this game. Uh, let's see, it looks like an old code. <laughs> Good thing mine's a pirated copy. I actually do have several copies, legitimate copies, so no harm, no foul. 1978. Can you believe that? Actually... Uh, this, yeah, this Amiga version by Bob Rakowski. And I, Walter Bright is the original guy. He did this back on in Fortran, I believe, on one of the mainframe computers. And then uh, the other guy there, Mark Baldwin, made the Atari ST version, which I think this is based on. I'm not really sure about the Amiga side of this story. So we can play up to two or three humans or two computer opponents. <laughs> or you can play upon it by mail. <laughs> Holy hell. <laughs> can you imagine how tedious that would be? I actually have to mail a disc back and forth. Let's see. How about Flippin' Barton? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Flippin' Barton in the house. <laughs> yeah, of course you're unable to find me in the commander's log. One of a kind. All right, we're loading up. Etruscans! I get to be the Etruscans. So you got a pretty good selection of maps you can load, or you can randomly pick one, or you can even make your own. It's always a good time. I've heard stories about kids that would make giant phallic-shaped maps. I wouldn't know anything about that. Alright, so what we want to start off with is just making, pumping out some armies. Pump out your little tinky guys here and send them on out. Now these uh, guys can only move one space per turn, which you can see why the multiplayer is rather fun. You know, you're going to be swapping, they call it a hot seat play, because the seat will still be warm by the time it's your turn. There's my first city, and I have struck out twice. You know, when my dad and I would play this, we had a rule, I think it was three strikes, and so if you... Uh, couldn't take your first city with three attempts, we'd let you start over. <laughs> so otherwise, you just would start off at too big of a disadvantage. Uh, on the other hand, though, it's a nice, you know, uh, this game was random enough where, how, how can I put this? You know, th there's enough of a random factor that you're never really uh, completely certain to die or to, to lose, right? Because you could get extraordinarily lucky or the computer could get extraordinarily lucky. Or unlucky, I guess. And, uh, so you know, it, I actually kind of like that. A lot of these strategy games, you get to a point and you realize it's just there's just no way you're going to win. Uh, whereas this, the random factor makes that unlikely, or at least uh, you feel like you have a chance. <laughs> okay, this little island I started off with only has two towns, 
Uh, so what I want to do at this point is get all the tanks going to that town and change its uh, production into... Uh, I think I already did, actually. Uh, usually what you want to do is make the first town you conquer into a transport producer. I'll tell you more about that in a second, but... Uh, right now it's just a race to get off of this island with an army. Start trying to find some other islands and take some more cities. Really what this comes down to is a war of production. There's no uh, tech tree, no leveling up of troops to worry about. It's just, uh, see how many armies you can make and get out there. Okay, there's my transport. The Motley Crew. So compared to a lot of the later strategy games, this is pretty simple. You only have eight units to worry about. Uh, and these, these armies and transports are the two most important by far. Uh, you can't just put your army out into the, into the water. You have to load them up onto these transports. And then you can unload them onto another island, or you can even attack a city directly if you could stumble across a coastal city. Uh, let's see, I'm hoping I'll get lucky. There we go. So I got lucky. Sometimes you can't find a coastal city. And you can just attack straight from the transport. Well, my dad, uh, for some reason, always insisted this was uh, a bad idea. He, he liked to unload his troops and attack from land, but... You know, I searched high and low through the manuals and through the even looked online, and I can't find any evidence that it actually gives you a disadvantage after doing that. But if you know better, uh, let me know. We did tend to win quite a bit, so maybe he knew something. All right. So the thing about this transport, the Motley Crew, he's uh, pretty vulnerable. I don't think the computers had enough time to get a bunch of cruisers and and. Uh, planes and things of that sort. I thought I saw someone there for a second. Hopefully the computer hasn't already gotten some subs and carriers and, or uh, uh, destroyers out in the water looking for me. Because uh, these transports make fine pickings. It's not completely weak, but if it gets attacked and takes any damage, I'll lose my armies or possibly even lose the whole transport. So it's always a risky maneuver, and I'm really wishing I could find a damn landmass with that transport, because I'm getting very nervous. There we go, finally. Jeez. Now, if you just get a toehold on an island, uh, that's enough. I mean, you could just keep pumping out armies with it and take eventually take over the rest of the island, but it probably would go faster if you gave them, uh, you know, just unloaded your whole transport there. So as we'll see, it's it's I think it's about a 50-50 chance of taking a town with an army. Yeah, it looks like I'm not going to find a transport or a city with that other transport. There we go. I got lucky again. Salamanca. Sala Salama Salamanca. <laughs> Salamanca. <laughs> no, I might. That's what two. Got two more tries. He might wipe me out. I might have to go back and get some reinforcements. Oh, crap. Try it one more time. <laughs> Whoa, okay, yeah, I lost that. Repulsed! Out here. That's really bad, because that was a... Oh, damn. That was a long ways to that town. So nothing to it. Gotta go back. Now, the pathfinding in this game is pretty horrific. It pretty much can only handle straight lines. Uh, so, yeah, that's another thing that adds to the tedium, you know, you have to constantly, you can't, you know, it'd be nice if I could just click the town and it'd be smart enough to go to it, but instead I'm going to have to get in there and fiddle with it a little bit to make him go to the town. Not, not a huge deal, but just eventually once you get, you know, hundreds of armies, it gets really tedious. Okay, so I think I'm going to go ahead and make some fighters with this city. My usual strategy with this game is to make lots of armies, transports, and fighters. And I like uh, the destroyers. I'll tell you what they what they do here. The I'll show you the fighter here in a second. It's a really fast unit. Can move five grid or five spaces per turn, so it's really good for scouting out an area and get to enemies fast. And they're relatively disposable, only slightly longer. I think they take about twice as long to make as an army. Uh, but they can get around the map really quickly, which makes them essential. The only problem is they've got a fuel supply. They can they they move 20 spaces total, and then they crash, and that's all she wrote. And of course, this is 
you know, back in the day uh, when there wasn't really such a concept as user friendliness as we know it today. So it won't, it won't warn you. And say, oh, you sure you want to send that plane out? You know, <laughs> you'll just crash. And, and if you accidentally move a ship or something into its path, it's going to crash. So. The other great ships to build are the submarines and the destroyers. Uh, the good thing about the submarines is they're invisible to most units. Only the uh, destroyers and the cruisers can see them. It's uh, really essential for a good sub-pilot because they're really strong on attack, but they suck on defense. You know, if, you get a, if a destroyer comes across your sub and attacks it, you're pretty much guaranteed to lose that. Uh, so that's uh, the advantage of the destroyer. They can see submarines for one thing. Uh, also, though, they can move three spaces. So they're very mobile, really good for scouting out things, and uh, that's about their only advantage, really. Uh, but to me, mobility pretty much trumps everything else. You know, especially if you've got a, whole, a lot more cities than the opponent does. And, you know, who cares if he's got some uh, battleships and some cruisers? I mean, if I can get uh, six or seven uh, destroyers out there and planes and all manner of other things, uh, it's not really going to matter. Well, I guess I shouldn't dismiss those other ships completely. The, uh, the, the big advantage of the cruisers and the battleships... Uh, they're big, tough units, for one thing, and uh, both of them can bombard the army units on land. I think the army units, though, get a little bit of a defensive bonus when that happens. And, you know, the risk of just losing a battleship or even damaging it kind of makes them a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, you could always experiment with them, see what you think. I definitely see how that could work. Alright, so what, what I need to do here, and I'm not doing really well, is to get some islands going that are be my army producers. Just have all the cities producing armies and then have them funneled into a centralized city for pickup by the transports. The only disadvantage to that strategy is that if somehow uh, the computer had his transport move in and take that city that had all those armies in it, I would lose everything. Uh, so for that reason, some people like to flank their city-producing city with some subs, maybe. Or just uh, put some sentries out around it. So that if he does atta attack, you can hopefully prevent it. But it's always a, you know, a problem. Uh, that's why you want to have make sure that your approach to your cities are well protected. You know, have a bunch of subs out there, a bunch of destroyers. You can put the planes on patrol and just have them... Going back and forth, trying to check for anything. Just keep in mind that they can't see subs, but then again, a submarine can attack your city, so it's all about the strategy. All right, let me read you a little bit from the manual here, and you'll uh, you can see what you think about the story. <coughs> the, oh, what is am I looking at here? Starfleet Headquarters, United Galactic Alliance, Starfleet Command. Not just me, or does that sound familiar? Anyway, let's see. From Grand Admiral, blah, 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 to Captain, blah, blah, blah. Regarding Operation Big Brother, security classification, top secret. So I guess they couldn't put this into the game so for some reason, so it's here in the manual. The Krellin Empire is invading Alliance space at an alarming rate and ravaging all the helpless planets in their path. Due to the vastness of the territory invaded, even the mighty Krellin Empire does not have enough warriors for full planetary assaults on each and every planet. Thus, the Krellins have developed Operation Big Brother. Its purpose is to subdue and conquer the low to medium technology planets, which the Krellins can accomplish with minimum forces. Yeah, it makes a certain amount of sense, I guess. A Krellin battle cruiser or troop transport teleports down one or two strategy and production teams to the largest and strongest city on the planet and installs one of their generals as emperor. With the introduction of some advanced technology but using the planet's own resources and manpower, they begin their conquest of the planet. After this planetary empire has been established, they hand the planet over to the Krellin Empire. <laughs> Mike, is it just me or does that sound like pretty much exactly the storyline of the Falling Skies show? Anyway, moving on. 
The United Galactic Alliance is even more sorely pressed than the Krellans for manpower and resources. It will be a great struggle to counter this new Krellan threat. Therefore, you, Captain William P. Brown, and your crew of the UGAS, uh, UGAS, Britannia, Britannia, interesting choice of names, hereby assigned to patrol the region of Alliance space as outlined in Attachment 1. Intercept as many Krellan vessels as possible to stop Operation Big Brother. You are to avoid detection by any Krellan forces. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You are to send one team to each Krellan invaded planet to try to unite the fractionalized cities. That's what we're doing. We're uniting the cities. We're not conquering them. Come on, we're liberators. Your team will form a counter empire to stop and defeat the growing Krellan planetary empire. Once the Krellan threat has been eliminated, the Alliance will convert the planet to a democratic government. <laughs> Well, I, what is this? It's it's eerie, man. It's like everything in this manual feels like it's uh, talking about modern times. <laughs> I'm scared. Uh, uh, Empire is not like, a, like huge bold letters. Not an arcade game. You must use strategy and tactics instead of hand-eye coordination to defeat your enemies. Apparently, this is part of the Starfleet family of strategic simulations. Uh, I haven't played any of these other games. Starfleet 2, Starfleet 3. No idea what those are. I'm kind of curious now. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of this game, though. Again, they were nice enough in this manual to... Man, I wish more manuals were like this. You know, all this so-called superfluous information, but I actually love reading this stuff. I like to, you know, know more about the people and the history of the game I'm playing. Uh, so it says here that this game, Empire was first written in Fortran 10 by Walter Bright while he attended Caltech between the years of 1976 and 79. 1981, Walter wrote an assembly language version for the PDP-11 and a version for the LSI-11 in 1983. So that's kind of... I wonder what he was running his uh, Fortran 10 version on. Uh, it doesn't say, but anyway, the PDP-11, LSI-11... In 1984, Empire was translated to the C programming language for the IBM PC, and they don't <laughs> tell me who did that. <laughs> uh, don't know if it was Walter or not. This version was marketed by Northwest Software between 84 and 87. Version of Empire for the VAX computer has been distributed by DECUS since 1980. It looks like it's this point where good old Mark Baldwin enters the picture. He did the Original version 2.0 of Empire for the Atari ST. Yeah, here, all other releases are based on the ST code, so... Maybe some of you ST fans can try out that version. Uh, let me know how it compares, if this is a faithful reproduction, or if it's better or worse, I'd like to know. Uh, let's see what else it says here. So he built that using C with the Mega Max C compiler. See, that's the kind of thing you need to know! I, I like... What was it compiled with? Mega Max C compiler. Now, development was also done with Mark Williams C compiler, the Micro Emacs editor, and Beckmeyer Micro C shell and utilities. Yeah, how's that? How's that for detail, man? You don't see uh, modern games giving you all that background. Oh wow! Even the sounds. The sounds were generated using synthetic software's GIST sound utilities. The title screens were title screens? The title screens were prepared on batteries included Dagos Elite. <laughs> oh, the program source code is approximately 18,700 lines long and overlaid in 22 files. Damn. <laughs> How much more specific can you get than that? Well, here's a little bit about this version. The Amiga version was written in C and 68,000 Assembler. Tools employed were Lattice C and Assembler, Innovatronics, Innovative, Innovatronic, Innova, <laughs> Innovatronics, I guess, Incorporated Power Windows 2.0, Power Windows, Metadimes, Metascope Debugger, and Scotto's Pizza. <laughs> Guy must have loved his pizza. A program consists of over one megabyte of source code, so take that, it's REST. Oh, wait a minute, though. Isn't a, a smaller footprint <laughs> better? Uh, anyway, 
Mm-hmm. And then you got the IBM version. Who cares about that? Boring. Yeah, why is this though? Gothic fonts. Apparently it uses something called a gothic font. That sounds pretty cool. I don't know what that is. Uh, that IBM source code is approximately 900k bytes and overlaid in 40 files. <laughs> You know, I actually do. I have the. I actually own the Commodore 64 version. I. I just couldn't imagine that. But you know, it was done on 6502 assembler. Uh, Tempest text editors, Koala Pad. Whoa! <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> now the program source code is approximately 27,000 lines long. You know. Okay. I'm curious enough. Uh, when we're done here, I'm gonna show you those other versions. You know, I just got to see what they look like. Commodore 64 version? Wow. I'm very curious. Maybe I can even find a version for the PDP-11. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be cool. Okay, author biographies. Now these guys are pretty interesting gentlemen. Now Walter Bright, as we said, he went to Caltech. He was a mechanical engineer, and he went to work for Boeing, designing gearboxes for the 757. And let's see, I think that's about all it says about him. Apparently he did his own C compiler. You know you're a pretty smart guy if you're doing your own C compiler. All right, and then Mark Baldwin. Uh, blah, blah, blah. He's a computer art instructor at a local Denver college. But he did a lot of cool stuff before that. He, uh, let's see, semi-normal life. Yeah, he's an engineer. For, he went to Purdue. Spent four years in the Air Force designing and studying ballistic missile trajectories. In 1979, he went to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas to work on the space shuttle program. For the next seven years, he was responsible for the design of shuttle, as, uh, shuttle ascent trajectories. <laughs> uh, though he loved the job, he hated Houston. So he moved to Denver to run his consulting business full time. Well, I wonder what he had against Houston. Come on, that's not that bad. I always enjoyed it. Let's see, I wonder, you know, I'm trying to remember what time the whole Challenger disaster happened. If he was working on shuttle ascent trajectories, he must have been right in the midst of that terrible tragedy. Maybe that's what uh, turned him off. Okay, anyway, back to the game here. Uh, so we got this handy production map. You can see what all your cities are producing. Try to figure out what cities would be good for your... Uh, army factories and which one can make ships for you. Uh, if it's if the city is landlocked like that one there, it can only do armies and fighters, so that might be a factor. So I'm just sending my planes out, trying my best not to send them out past 11. You know, it'd be so much, so awesome if I could do some waypoints or, you know, just just a little bit more of a sophisticated system here to keep me from <laughs> crashing my planes. I do that all the time. And wouldn't it be great too if these if there was some way you could see more than just the tiles immediately around you? Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but one of the reasons I'm playing this again, uh, I just besides the nostalgia, you know, I love the nostalgia feeling for this, but I was reading uh, when I was researching my book on the civilization chapter. I found out something interesting. Apparently Sid Meier was a huge fan of this game. Just played it all the time, too, you know. And when they set out to make Civilization, that was the original plan, was to uh, make a game very similar to this. And I think Civilization, uh, especially the first one, uh, is very similar to this. And I think they were just going to have uh, different eras. So you know, you'd have different eras with different kinds of units. You know, historically based. Uh, but then, I don't even think it was Sid's idea. I think it was the guy he was working with mentioned, uh, you know, why not have a, you know, like a tech tree type system where, you know, you do research and development and you could, you know, work your way through throughout history like that. Start up, oh, see, mine. <laughs> uh, he might be able to make it back. And uh, Sid was like, oh, that's a cool idea. You know, sure, let's give, let's try that out. You know, so basically one way to think about Civilization is just this game Empire. But it has, uh, instead of having all the units, all these modern troops right off the bat, you start off, you know, with, with barbarians and spearmen and archers and 
uh, gradually work your way up the tree. But it's very... You know, it's obvious to me there's a strong influence. You know, sometimes you could almost imagine you were playing Civilization. Uh, some of those touches you could tell, too. It's, it's probably just playing this game, and he's like, you know, I wish there was a way I, you could see a little better. You know, maybe we'll make that an upgrade or make a troop that can see around better than the other ones. So, yeah, they definitely owe this game a, a huge debt. Now, I don't know much more about Walter Bright, where he got the idea for this, that there was uh, games out similar to this. You know, maybe maybe he was inspired by something else. Probably a a board, a war game, a board game, <laughs> board game, war game. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Oh, well, this is getting very dicey here. I need to move that tank out of the way. If I would have thought about it, I probably could have waited, but got him back. So that is one thing to keep in mind. You don't have to play right away. You can hit W to wait and take you you know move that unit later. You get space to skip a turn. Then, of course, you could put it on sentry duty. You could have it patrol back and forth between two points. Uh, I think there's a move at random command, and then a move in a direction command. At least the move in direction command works for the planes. Uh, so I won't move it out until it crashes. But you see how delicate that is? You know, that little mouse mover maneuver? I mean, if you just a little bit careless and move it 11 spaces, you can kiss that jet goodbye. All right, so I'm doing pretty well here, looks like. Now you see, now I got some destroyers in the water. I'm trying to find that computer before he finds me. Really, maybe he's had a tough time getting started. I haven't seen any of his planes. Usually you see some of his planes or transports by now. I don't think I've seen one. So I'm just on the lookout, hoping he doesn't come across me before I come across him. If I'm really lucky, I'll be able to find his home base and just land a bunch of armies on it and just take him out blitzkrieg his ass and that'll be all she wrote and there's another little kind of iffy island it probably is a smart idea uh, to go ahead and, and no matter what have you know at least six armies on each island just hanging out ready to uh, take back the city if he shows up but I always like to play more offensively than that I just I want to get to him and land an army as quickly as possible. That's my strategy or lack thereof. Got the Steel Panther headed to him. Now again, I mean, that transport, he, if it gets spotted by a submarine, he could take it out. All six armies. Boom, boom, boom. So that's why you, it's never a bad idea to have a bunch of submarines, you know, out around. You don't want to use, you probably don't want to use them to explore. You want to have them guarding your territory. Or I guess you could station them out around his territory and just, you know, ambush his submarine or his uh, transports. Okay. Really, at this point, I have no idea where that computer is. You know, these planes do start to get annoying after a while. You feel like you're just moving, spending the whole time just moving planes around. <laughs> I guess you could put them on patrol duty, but they're just so useful to quickly explore, quickly map out an area. You can just get one town in a landmass. You just send a plane up to it, and in no time you can map it out, figure out where to send your armies. Well, looks like we're coming along here. I think it's a good spot, probably, to skip ahead a bit and show you some of the later games. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll see if I can find the computer for you. So it looks like about 25 turns later and I've stumbled across his his uh, transport vessel. I'll have a chance to destroy it, the Van Halen Destroyer. Uh, there's, the destroyers, though, they're not that great on combat, so he might actually win this. But hopefully I can at least damage him. Nope, I sank him. So it took two hits. So what that means is <laughs> now I can only move one tile per turn. But I can get him, if I can get him back to a town and rest him up, he'll be back in back in shape, so... That's pretty cool. Destroyed his transport. Probably had six armies on it. Headed to one of my land masses. Threat dispatched. You see, that's why it's a good idea to have those uh, transports escorted. If it had a couple of subs out there or some destroyers, he would have probably been able to see me coming. Or uh, even just 
I'd have to attack them first. Or if it's a submarine, I wouldn't. With the destroyer, I could see it. But if I had another kind of ship, like a transport, you might accidentally just stumble over a submarine. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds, though, because the submarines, as I said, they have a sucky defense. So even a transport ship can sometimes... It's, it's probably about 50-50, I guess. I, I don't know the math, but... You, know, you can usually destroy a submarine if you attack it first. So I know he's over there on the right somewhere. Let's see if I can get to him. Take out some of his cities. You know what some people like to do is to... They build these aircraft carriers. And have them flanked by... On each side by a submarine. And that's necessary because of the... Oh my god. It's, it's a disaster if you lose an aircraft carrier full of uh, airplanes. Uh, but once you get that... Once you get that set up going, that convoy going, you can just park that sucker pretty much anywhere, wipe out all his uh, army units, and then land it. You know, you transport there, take out his city. And, yeah, that's a pretty good strategy, but there's a lot of uh, setup time required for that. Building all those subs. Aircraft carriers take forever to build, too. I just would rather uh, take out one of his cities and then move my planes onto it. It's a little bit easier, though, when you're playing against the AI, because it's not nearly as smart or as cunning as a human opponent would be. So, I still have to move all these things. This is, this is what kind of <clears throat> makes the game a little dull after a while, you know. You're just moving all these units around. You got this battle. There we go. <laughs> See, that's where the excitement is, but, you know, I'm still over there filling around with random army units. I remember when I used to play this uh, two-player. Sometimes these turns, would, you know, it stretch out and end up taking 20, 30 minutes per turn. And man, you'd just be uh, well. Usually, what I would do is just have a novel I was reading, Piers Anthony's Anth novel, maybe, or Dragon Lance, something like that. Kind of, kind of cool. Of course, you don't want to look at your opponent's screen as you're playing because that would be cheating. You know, although sometimes what we would do is just uh, team up against the computer. You know, that was the way to play this. Or Okay, so it looks like Steel Panther is ready for some more troops. Probably should have set up my restocking solution a little better than that. Let's see if I can take out his city. So he didn't have any defense on that city. He's really not playing too smart. And I got it! Trafalgar! Well, Trafalgar meets a new boss. <laughs> now, he might have some more armies around, hanging out around this little area. Oh, there's a plane. Let's see if my destroyer can take it out. Got it. No problem. Way to go, Saxon. <laughs> Hells to the year. Yeah, I got all these planes on this carrier here, but... Uh, it gets so complicated because, man, if you move that jet and then you move that carrier, you can very easily run him out of fuel again. You know, there really should have been some better way to deal with the fuel on those planes. I mean, some more cities. Bada boom, bada bing. Okay, so it looks at this point like I'm in pretty good shape to win this. Uh, as far as I could tell, the computer only has a couple of cities over there in the corner. And it's just a matter at this point of just continue uh, to build up my infrastructure, get more, uh, get these troops loaded up, uh, get these transports loaded up with troops a bit faster, get a bunch of subs over there guarding uh, all around his territory so he can't get anything in or out. And that'll be the game. Uh, so let's just briefly, I'm very curious now, I want to see if we can find some of these other versions to look at, so... Uh, give me a second and I'll be back and I'll see what I can find. Okay, I guess we'll start with this one. This is the uh, one of the Unix versions. PDP I was able to find on a server. You can see it up there, empire.openmp.com. And this is about as basic as it gets. You know, as you can see, this interface is... Uh, really spartan. I just can't imagine trying to play this game like this. I guess all the information is there. Definitely a much different kind of experience than I was getting with the Amiga. 
I couldn't, you know, I got this thing uh, jammed up one time. I couldn't even figure out how to escape out of the, the menu. <laughs> like tried to enter some move coordinates and then decided uh, it said I didn't have anything to move. And they just, I'll be damned. I couldn't figure out what key escape, you know, nothing would get me back to the main menu again. So I just had to start all the way over. No units, no sectors capable of radar. And this looks, this looks pretty involved. It looks like it has a lot of features that the, oddly enough, the later versions don't have. I mean, what the heck are explosives? There's a map. <laughs> so, you know, these, these old mainframe games are always weird. I mean, on the one hand, the graphically and the interface always, well, almost always sucks. On the other hand, they usually have some pretty interesting features that the later games omit for whatever reason. So, anyway, there's the... I guess this is probably the earliest version I'm going to show. Uh, really, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to play it like this, but I guess if you grew up playing this, uh, you might actually prefer this version. But I certainly don't. Uh, let's look at that IBM, uh, the early IBM version next. So here we go with that one. I think this is version 1. Point, either 1.0, 1.3, something like that. As you can see, it's got a kind of a rogue-like interface to it. It's definitely easier for me to play than that Unix version. The graphics definitely help. Look, it has character set graphics. Uh, you know, gameplay-wise, it feels very similar to the uh, the Amiga version. I mean, I'm just using the keyboard instead of the mouse to move around, but, you know, I could see getting into this. You know, it's it's not bad. I don't know what any of these commands are. I guess you need to have the manual reference card handy. But overall, looks neat. But let's look at that uh, Interstell IBM version. It's like typical CGA graphics. Probably just working with the PC speaker, too. Well, let's get in here, see what the interface looks like. Random. You can definitely see the similarities. You know, it doesn't look that much different to me than the Amiga version. Sound is not very... Not that the version, not that the sound of the Amiga was all that great, but... This doesn't even sound as good as that. <laughs> tap, tap, tap. <laughs> Capture Japana. But, you know, it's, it moves nice. Uh, I don't know. The mouse control seems a little bit tighter somehow. At least it feels easier for me to maneuver. It seems to have a bit of a snap to it, uh, which I like. Make, to definitely make it easier not to crash your fighters. So overall, this, you know, this definitely seems like a competent version here. I don't know if I would prefer this to the Amiga, but it's it's not bad. So let's take a look at that Atari ST version. <laughs> like the little machine gun blast. So definitely a graphical step up from that DOS version for sure. Otherwise, it looks pretty much the same. Let's get in here. I'm sort of curious what he, what they consider to be the 2.0 version. Maybe this has better graphics. I guess the uh, intro was a little more graphically enhanced. <laughs> but sorry. And by the way, yeah, you guys, you can appreciate this. It was <laughs> God, it was hard getting this thing running on the Atari ST. It took forever to find, and then it wasn't in the proper format. It was in some kind of weird STX format, and I had to figure out how to use a product called Pasty. So you're looking at about about two hours, maybe three hours of work to get this thing to find it and get it to, to get it to work and. Uh, even here, it's giving me some trouble, but I think we got it. Hopefully, yeah, there we go. Okay. So, doesn't look bad. Something else that's weird, I don't know why, but Steam, S-T-E-E-M, uh, not the Steam network, 
It's making my mouse really funky. Must have a trip to settings somewhere. Otherwise, though, it, you know, I gotta say it this time. It doesn't really look all that good. I think the DOS version actually looks a little better than this. Sound is not all that great, and... Some of those menus, it reminds me of a Macintosh. More than the Atari ST, which makes me wonder if there's a Mac version of this somewhere. There's also some kind of weird control issues. It's not letting me move to the diagonal with the keyboard. I don't know what's up with that. It seems to be an off and on thing. Uh, just overall seems a bit rough. Maybe that's why it was so hard to find. Uh, maybe the ST fans just <laughs> didn't like this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say the Amiga is a pretty clear winner. But we got one more version to try, the Commodore, so let's look at that. So they did a pretty good job on that intro, I would say. It's kind of neat that they kept that machine gun effect. Adds a little splash and dash. I don't know if this has support for the mouse. I know there was a, a mouse for the Commodore 64. I'm just trying to play this with the joystick. It's kind of funky. But it's not as bad as you would think. I'm a little surprised this... Now, I haven't really looked into the manual. I'm sure there's all kinds of keyboard shortcuts to make this more playable, but... And it would definitely be <laughs> interesting to try to play this with a key... Oh, with a joystick, moving these troops around. You know, and the weird thing is, there's no sound at all. It's a bit surprising, because the Commodore 64 had a, you know, that really cool SID chip in it. you think they would have taken advantage of that somehow. Could definitely make good uh, explosion sounds and tank sounds, but for whatever reason, it's... I don't know if maybe I have my emulator set up wrongly, or this ROM file's corrupt somehow, but I don't hear any sound effects. But overall, it doesn't look bad. Uh, definitely would not want to play this one, though. <laughs> yeah, I would say for my money, the Amiga version holds up pretty well. That's probably still my preferred version. Uh, second... The, that, that later DOS version was pretty good. Uh, these other versions, though, I would just avoid. Anyway, folks, there you have it. Empire, classic war game, all of these different formats to choose from. Uh, if you know this game, have played some of these other versions, let me know. Or if you played some of the later games that followed this, there's an Empire 2, uh, Empire Deluxe, all those. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. But I think that'll do it for now. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hoping to be back next week. I'm not going to make any promises, though, because I have a massive uh, a book deadline coming up for Vintage Games 2.0, and I'm kind of scarily behind at the moment, so I'm really going to you know, pull out all the stops to try to get that done, and that might include postponing Mad Chat a bit. I'll see what I can do, though. Maybe I'll get everything wrapped up, but if I, you don't see me for a while, you know what happened. Uh, as always, though, I want to thank you very, very, very much. If you have supported this show, you guys are totally, completely awesome. Uh, if you'd like to go uh, support the show yourself, just go to the Patreon link. And remember, whatever amount you guys want, whatever you think the show is worth, you know, a buck an episode, two bucks an episode, whatever uh, you guys can afford and, you know, that you want to kick in, I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? A couple interesting news items this week. Uh, Divinity Original Sin, I don't know if I mentioned this, this yet, but they're uh, doing a second game, their Divisional, Divinity Original Sin 2. They've kickstarted this. They were asking for 500K, and they've already hit 1.28 million. So really phenomenally well, and they've got 22 days left on that. 
I just asked you to get over there and put in your order for the uh, your digital copy at least. Um, let's see, bigger skill tree. Oh, the, the stretch goal, the next stretch goal, I think is 1.3, I believe. I didn't write that down foolishly. Uh, but that's going to get us a bigger skill tree. And I'm not sure what else is coming after that, but I'm sure they got some, some great plans. So i uh, really looking forward to that. And I might get uh, uh, the developer back on if you guys would like, and we can talk to him about the uh, what, what to expect in the sequel. Uh, some other news about retro games. Uh, these, this is coming from Carl, Will, Carl Williams of Retro Gaming Magazine. Uh, there's a new Pac-Man out, new homebrew Pac-Man for the Atari 2600. This is an 8K edition, and <laughs> obviously a lot better than old Todd Fry's version back in the day. Uh, on a related note, uh, Bonk's Revenge. Uh, there's an uncensored version of that out now uh, for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And apparently the controversy was over some kind of thief sprite. You know, I, you know, I looked at it, and I'm not really seeing what the <laughs> controversy was. Uh, maybe you guys can fill me in on that, but... At any rate, the uncensored version is now available, uh, unofficially, of course. All right, what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I've got a little number here from JP's again. Remember I did their red uh, red ale last time. This is a Casper White Stout, beer with natural flavor added, uh, adventure brews with a twist. Uh, this is 6% alcohol, so not bad. A little bit stronger than a, than a macro brew, but uh, definitely drinkable. Let's see, James Page Brewing Company out of Stevens Point, Wisconsin. This is a white stout with a white buffalo on it. <laughs> uh, not seeing any other information here about the hops or anything, so uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Casper here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I think it's too bad I don't have Casper the dog here. and see what he would uh, think about it. Uh, getting a nice aroma off this kind of a... Uh, very Belgian-y flavor or aroma to this, a kind of a citrusy, uh, a little bit of a cocoa-like, uh, what is that? Uh, there's another aroma in there, kind of reminds me of a Mountain Dew. Anyway, it smells really sweet, really good, uh, very interesting. I've never quite smelled one uh, just like this. It's uh, definitely kind of exotic, so uh, let's give it a taste. A pretty interesting uh, flavor there. It's a very pungent. You get kind of a, uh, what is that, sort of a malt flavor, a lot of citrus in this. It's uh, very sweet. I uh, don't really taste any alcohol at all. Not really very bitter. There's kind of a, a, a peachy-like aftertaste to it. I'll try it again. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of different flavors here. Uh, very definitely uh, strong on the citrus. It's nice, thick. Uh, not really bitter at all. I don't really know what to make of it, though, to be honest. I'll try it again. You know, a slight metallic taste on the finish there. Uh, but overall, not bad. You know, it, it's... Uh, what, to, what to give this one... Uh, you know, I'm thinking somewhere like a 3 out of 5 on this one, too. You know, it's not bad. It's uh, interesting. A lot of different flavors going on. I'm not going to say it's my favorite. I'd want to drink 100 of these or anything, but, you know, it's not bad. So I think 3 out of 5 about says it all for the Casper White Stout. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about war. And I found a really good one that I think is a spot on from our old friend General Patton. It goes something like this. A pint of sweat spares a gallon of blood. See you guys next week, hopefully. Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis is the best video game ever. I disagree. It's a very good game, but I think Donkey Kong is the best game ever. Donkey Kong sucks. You know something? You suck. <laughs>